Hello, Patriots. Today, I have got the wise one back with me, my mother, and she has found an amazing guest for us, and I cannot wait to hear what he all has to say, and mom has found him, and mom, you went to school with our next guest, correct? I did. So you want to tell us about, first of all, why don't you just tell us a little bit while we have him off camera and he can't say anything, tell us what you remember about him in school. Well, actually, his brother was in my class in, in Thailand. So um, I, I don't remember a lot about Pete, but we've been in touch the last couple of years. And I really appreciate his his writings of late and his viewpoint and the fact that he's knowledgeable about a lot of different things. And he's going to tell us about that today. So, so we will... <laughs> welcome to the show, Pete Crendeton. <laughs> Did I say that right? Just remember. Uh, yes. Kitten, but Critten, Din. But that's quite right. Yeah, Pronounce okay. the way it's spelled. Okay. <laughs> well, Pete, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on today and, and to hear what all you do know. I know Mom's been really excited about interviewing you, so I am equally as excited to hear what kind of information you have to say. <laughs> so, you guys, Mom, take it away. I don't even know exactly why Pete's here, what you guys want to discuss. But um, I do want, and, you know, I have some things I want to ask Pete, like once you get the conversation going. All right. Well, hey, Pete, glad to have you on finally. <laughs> finally glad to catch up with you. We were supposed to do a recording, what, a couple of weeks ago? And you had a, a slight <laughs> interference. <laughs> uh, that's right. I, I had to blast out of town. A contract came up and I've been doing uh, armed security down in Fort Myers, Florida, uh, as part of the uh, hurricane response. Oh, so Pete, what what do you actually do now? What is your role? What is your job? You know, considering you and mom went to school together in Thailand, um, that that alone is interesting. What first of all, what do you remember my mom at all from school? Um, not very well. Uh, she would have been a senior in my junior year, so she was totally off limits. You know, <laughs> out of bound. <laughs> And, and from what I hear, she was so concerned about getting back to the States. You know, she needed to leave Bangkok to come back to the States to find out what was going on here. I think that while you guys are abroad, my brother um, has has two sons and they were living in Germany and they always felt like they were missing something here. And literally, I flew over. Um, I had to go to Paris for something and I flew over and surprised them for 24 hours. And I was like, you're not missing anything. Nothing is happening over there. Like, don't don't let your friends fake you out on social media. Nothing is happening. You have a lot more going on here than they do there, and you're learning a lot more. So did you ever feel like that growing up in school? That's funny you should say that because I lived in Thailand for 10 years, um, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I, I spent the entire 1970s and my entire adolescence in Bangkok, Thailand, and, you know, all around Thailand. And at the time, it was the 1970s. There was so much going on uh, over in the States and in Europe, you know, big concert, everything. And we were completely missing out. There was no concert scene. No big bands uh, came and toured over there. I think the first band that showed up was Blondie for uh, New Year's 1979, I believe. Um, we thought we were missing out. We thought we were in a <laughs> cultural desert. And then in, in retrospect, the, the life was so rich. Uh, you know, the culture is so intense in Thailand. Um, you know, it, it's just you've got to see it to believe it. And the odd thing is, the ironic thing is, we thought we were missing out. Yeah, that's pretty funny because from what mom has said her entire you know, senior year, she felt like she was missing out and couldn't wait to get yeah. back home to Georgia. And Pete, if you were to see where my mom went back home to, you would really like get a big laugh because it's like literally in the country. There's like chickens everywhere, <laughs> cows everywhere. <laughs> I love Thailand, and, by the way. And, and she had me. <laughs> She doesn't, she doesn't know what she's talking about, Pete. Ignore all that because I love Thailand. I loved my life overseas. It's just that you know how it is. When you come to the end of the schooling years, there's not yeah. a lot of job opportunity and there's not a lot of university opportunity because the internet did not 
exactly. pretty much didn't exist back then. So that's kind of unfair. You're looking at it from today's perspective, darling. <laughs> no, no, no. I was just saying, like, but when when you came back, didn't you think that you were like that? You know. Yeah, but that's you know what. Let's let's talk about something else because it's uh, Pete has so much to share. He has so much to share. I just finished reading one of his books. So, Pete, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So you spent all 10 years in Thailand, which I wish I would have spent 10 years in Thailand, uh, to be honest with you, but I didn't have that chance. So, I mean, I lived in Africa, Turkey, Mexico City, and and then moved to Bangkok, Thailand. So I'm, we were like globe trotting right. around the world because my dad worked for Army Intelligence. But since then... Uh, so you were uh, you were actually Australian, and your dad. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, my dad was a mechanical engineer, and he built power plants in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. My earliest memories are in Sumatra, and um, we actually he, he was working for an American company, so we were able to return to the states for a couple of years uh, before he got the itch again in those days there was the money was overseas they were building asia so we ended up in bangladesh spent four years there back then it was east pakistan um they had a civil war uh and we experienced all the uh the tumult going up to that uh got out of there um then my dad got another contract in Bangkok, Thailand. We arrived in Bangkok in 1970, and us kids thought we had died and gone to heaven because in Bangladesh, no telephones, no TV, uh, shortwave radio. We could listen to the BBC and to uh, Voice of America, um, and that was it. That was it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, life was uh, very simple, uh, very rural uh, over there in, in Bangladesh. Uh, got to Thailand, like I said, and for the first five years that I lived there, the U.S. military was huge. It was the height of the Vietnam War. Bangkok was a garrison town, as you recall. We saw soldiers in uniform walking up and down Sukhumvit Road and downtown all the time. They had entire hotels uh, that were leased as office buildings and uh, where they lived. Um, there were huge facilities for the military families. And of course, that was off limits to uh, us non-military types. Um, but it was just, it was overwhelming, the, the military presence. Uh, we saw a little of military activity, um, uh, mostly down in south, uh, uh, down by uh, uh, south of Pattaya. There's a place called Utapau, Roatai Air Base, and uh, Sadaheep, uh, which is a, uh, a harbor down there. And we could actually see B-52s taking off. That was about as much as we ever saw of the Vietnam conflict, you know, the Indochina War, which is what I refer to it as. Although we saw a lot of action in Thailand, in Bangkok itself, there was a bloody revolution, a coup d'etat um, in 1974 in your senior year. I think you recall that, um, where it, it got really out of control. The extraordinary thing was they would have coups d'etat but it would always happen um, on the political side of town. It never happened on the commercial side of town or the, the tourist side of town. So really you'd be going about your business and there's a bloody revolution going down and you really wouldn't know it until you saw the newspaper later in the day. <laughs> it's kind of extraordinary. Anyhow, that was, uh, that was my upbringing in Thailand. I um, hung around for uh, about 18 months after I graduated high school until things got counterproductive. Then I uh, ended up in Australia, uh, where I fit in like a uh, round peg in a square hole. Um, had an opportunity to go to the States because my dad was working for that American company. And there was the opportunity to get a green card. So I jumped on it. I thought, this is good. Got over to the States, had the same sort of troubles. And it's like this. And any international kid can identify with this. You look like you come from America. You sound like you come from America, but you don't come from America. You're not from the uh, country you came from, even though you consider that home. Uh, but if you tell somebody, you know, if somebody says, where are you from? And you tell them, they think that you're you're spinning a, a tall tale. Um, they look at you like you've got two heads. So you tell a lie. Oh, well, I'm from San Francisco. Oh, really? I'm from San Francisco. What high school did you go to? <laughs> you know, you can't win. You cannot win. Uh, these days, people ask me, where are you from? I just say I'm from uh, overseas. I grew up overseas. 
and I live in Pennsylvania and just keep it simple uh, because it's something that bothers you all your life and all your life you feel like um, you're on the outside looking in uh, no matter where you are. Although I feel very much at home when I'm in places like Southeast Asia, Africa, that's where I really fit in. That's really interesting, Pete. Uh, so when, it, when you're talking about the different areas, uh, I just wanted people to understand, you know, because I, I think, you know, as a outsider in America, I don't think people realize how close everything is. And yeah. um, we don't realize our true history. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have with people understanding like where we are today. Uh, because, you know, here in America, while you guys were overseas, you know, there were all these concerts going on and, um, you know, there, but you didn't realize like really where you are. And I just wanted to give everybody kind of a geographical view of where things were located. So like this is Bangladesh that you were in. This is where Thailand, where you grew up. You know, we have Cambodia and Vietnam. You know, so people really need to understand how close everything really is and how in relationship it is to China and, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, Japan, South Korea, because, you know, even though we might have learned our seven continents, uh, we didn't really learn uh, where, you know, where they're really located today as adults, you know, because really what's happening here, you know, from somebody who, you know, I've traveled quite a bit and been to many of the continents, but the reality is I only know what I know from going there, not from school at all. Matter of fact, I hated school. So where you guys actually grew up in a totally different mindset, I try to give our audience the perspective of, you know, what you guys had and then also what we were dealing with here uh, for being undereducated you know, for not learning about, you know, what was going on on the other side of the world and why we should really care about it because, you know, it all, you know, everything that's really gone on there. I mean, I have people in Bangladesh, um, Pakistan, India, and the Philippines that I speak with daily in China that I speak with daily. And they always, you know, can see things progressing way before we can because they bother to look at our news. And so they're they're constantly I feel like they're constantly sending out warning signs of maybe what they're going to try to do here next um, because of what they've done there. So do you ever feel like, uh, you know, like now that you're back and you kind of see things, do you ever see, you know, any similarities or like you feel like, you know, that came about, you know, maybe 30 years ago in a country that you were in or anything like that? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly what I can say is the United States has almost unlimited opportunities. You can do or be anything you want. You can be born in a trailer park, not know who your father is and end up becoming one of the most popular presidents of the United States ever. And his name was Bill Clinton. Um, you can be a guy like Barack Obama who we're not exactly sure where he comes from or what his uh, status was citizenship wise, but somehow he became president of the United States. And I just think that's remarkable. Um, and um, beyond that, I would say, uh, yeah, there's, um, there's things that we take for granted here in the United States. And I'll start with freedom of speech. I can say anything I want. I can, I can say the most outrageous, outlandish, scandalous things. I can make a big sign, a sandwich board, and stand in front of the White House saying it, you know. And the same kind of words are described as hate speech in the British Commonwealth. That is Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And if I, I put up such a, a, you know, a sign, something extraordinary like that, oh, no, 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 you go to jail. Um, now, that's an extreme version of it, but in other countries, like in Thailand, you cannot criticize the royal family. You'll go to jail. Oh, that. Yeah, you cannot. I know, right. I know China that we can't, you know, they have zero freedom of speech um, because they try to send me things on VPNs a lot. Um, but, you know, here in the United States, one of the things that I saw when I first landed in China um, was my phone pretty much being shut off at the airport with no means of communication whatsoever. 
Um, and I, I call them my handlers now because I didn't realize, you know, when I first went that they're handlers, that, you yeah. know, I wasn't allowed out of their sight because they wanted me to see what they wanted me to see in the manufacturing world. And they didn't want me to sway over here or sway to the right. And I'm really good at that, by the way. I don't I'm not the one to just go on the, the tourist trail and be done. I actually want to go eat where, you know, locals eat and see what they do. And um, when I realized how censored they were, it was kind of a scary thought because if I hadn't been smart enough to know what a VPN was, and, you know, we've only started hearing about VPNs the last three or four years here in America because of censorship. So like right now I can show you, and actually I may do this uh, while, while you guys are chatting uh, and bring up later in the episode of where and what has been censored off of my own personal social media yeah. and what's been censored off of the YouTube, because I think that even might surprise you that we really don't have free speech. And that is a huge concern of mine, you know, that that actually started, believe it or not, with Julian Assange. And I know, you know, a lot of people in the military may think he's such a bad guy because they think, you know, secrets were leaked through him. But the reality is it's, um, a lot of us who stood with him and WikiLeaks because we want to know the truth about the government and what they're actually doing um, with that Bill Clinton who grew up in the trailer and um, who became our president, um, you know, with Barry Seal and many other things that are even, you know, gone on in Miami with cocaine cowboys. You know, there's been just so much go on that that I feel like we they've segmented us. And when I don't, I don't mean just you and I, but just segmented people to the point where some of us know what's happened and some of us don't to the point where if somebody tells me that they robbed um, and, and actually stole children out of Haiti when they had the, the earthquake there, the hurricane, whatever it was they had that back in the 90s that I actually gave money to. You know, when I find out from an actual Haitian that saw things happen that actually works here by building. You know, that's very, very hard to believe, you know, that that actually did happen, you know, because like, you know, they call it a conspiracy theory. And you said earlier that they label things that it's censored. Uh, what was it you said that they they call it a mistruth? Well, there, there's there's hate speech. There's mistruths. There's yeah. disinformation. Yeah. Yeah. So basically um, for actually posting something that um, I'll call him Beijing Biden, because that's what I call him. Uh, for posting something that he actually said, my account on Facebook has been censored. Yeah. Which they they have things grayed out. And all I did was post exactly what he said. Yeah. Well, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, the, uh, the social media giants, uh, these are private platforms. And so they, they use that. They're, well, they're private organizations, they're companies, and they use that uh, as grounds for, uh, for, for censorship, they say, oh, yeah, you can have freedom of speech. You say whatever you want. You can't say it here in our house. Um, right. But actually, they're public corporations, I believe. And the, it's going, the process is going through the courts. And it's very similar to, um, well, you know, a utility. I get my electricity. I get my water. I get my cable TV, you know, from these places. They are conduits. And uh, they cannot, uh, uh, you know, inhibit my uh my human rights my uh uh you know constitutional rights and so that's being debated at this time but i think it's also telling look who's doing this censorship it's the left the left owns facebook the left owns twitter the left owns all these levers of power the left owns the media the left owns uh academia uh they they're they've got it all and Look at how they're conducting themselves. They're using tactics and techniques which are straight out of Stalinistic Russia. Uh, yeah. They do, you know, they do uh, censorship. Uh, they, you know, if they could ban books, they would do it, um, and, and et cetera, right on down the line. Yeah, absolutely. So I, mean, well, so I was just, I just wanted to bring in something because. Um, you know, we were talking about growing up in Thailand and the difference is that we didn't have the internet back then. That's right. And we only knew, you mentioned the coup d'etat and 
so we would get a, what a vacation from school. And the yeah. only way that we knew what was happening really was when we got two weeks later, we get a um, letter uh, through snail mail from the APO address from my grandmother that's saying, are you okay? Is everything okay? Because they were hearing it on the news over here. So now fast forward to, um, to these days and where, uh, freedom of speech, supposedly, but we have so much bigger reach yeah. um, with social media and the internet and everything. But I'll tell you, okay, so Christy said that she was censored when she was in China. Yeah. Okay, I was in Washington, D.C. on one certain day, not going to name the date, but you can just fill in the blanks. I, all of our cell phones were censored. Okay, so there yeah. you go. There's the power of overreach. You weren't only censored, but you were not only censored, but you couldn't even record with your own camera. I couldn't even record phone. with my own video camera, not even going online. That's how censored we were. Mm -hmm. Trying to get directions to get back to Union Station. Okay. Yeah. So that's here in the United States. And so that's the difference of us growing up over in Thailand and overseas, where you had really very slow moving news as compared to to today i mean we know it from minute to minute we know when something happens oh it's a, it's a whole different world these days mm -hmm. so there's a, one, one thing i want everybody to know while we're talking about facebook and one reason i brought up is because i i believe in uh recording you know what they have on and we're on wikipedia right now and basically, you know, Facebook started out as a Florida company. Um, mm -hmm. One of the first uh, Series A funders was Excel Partners. And, you know, I learned all of this directly in the Silicon Valley. Um, I am an NBC spokesperson um, for uh, social media. And I used to be on NBC News Silicon Valley quite a bit, um, telling you know small businesses about what they could expect next regarding social media. I actually went for Series A and Series B, and I even angel investments for from for several companies. And uh, one of the things that people really need to realize is our government, our um, military, uh, the Department of Defense actually had through DARPA had a company called lifelog that shut down the very day that facebook started and so we should all be questioning ourselves and you know how come every time i've gone to an organization and uh, went to speak with uh, randy zuckerberg which is mark zuckerberg's um, sister or mark himself they don't want anyone really speaking with him you know it's it's very much an, a you know a time line question and they usher them in and out of the room and i personally believe that they don't want that to happen simply because they know that some of us know the truth and the right questions to ask and um, they might not be able to cover up you know the whole darpa scheme that we all know and and the truth about what really happened because uh, our military industrial complex has somewhat bought out a lot of these organizations. Um, so we may think that we haven't paid for um, items like Facebook, but I think that it was a great way for them to basically get all of our data entered in by us um, so that they could then begin to track us. I mean, I think that's what, one of the things that I would like every military person that I know to look into uh, because it is a big, you know, it's a big scheme. And if you think about who's running our elections right now, or I'll call them selections, um, you know, Facebook with his Zuck bucks um, have really controlled the power of our entire elections. And it's pretty, it's a pretty scary thought. And the acquisitions that they've tried to take on, they really will not let any other um, company really come about on the scene because of that. And it's just, it's very interesting. I think it's all very interesting. I'm sorry I didn't mean to keep on ranting about about this, but I am very concerned about our free speech. Well, on the subject of social media, I don't go by my real name. I abbreviate my name. And uh, my birthday, every October 12th, I get all this happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. I was not born on October 12th. Okay. And uh, I'm not actually 10 years younger than what I am. So I'll just put it that way. Um, 
yeah, I give out as little as I possibly can. I explore the whole concept of our digital footprint in a novel that I'm writing right now, and it's becoming extremely difficult to uh, to write. How long could a person become anonymous and with no, you know, uh, digital footprint in the United States in this day and age? And uh, the best estimate I can come up with is about 45 days. And that includes even if you have a cell phone, a certain type of cell phone, certain type of service, um, putting it in a Faraday bag, turning it off, putting it in a Faraday bag as you move around. Sooner or later, you have to have access to cash. Sooner or later, you, you have to use a credit card. Um, so about 45 days, um, and that would really be pushing it. Um, and uh, I know we were going to talk a little bit about survival and about what I was doing down in Florida with the weather, you know, with the, uh, the hurricane. I was response. hoping so. <laughs> but um, it, 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 this is something that I'm concerned about. And the overarching uh, power and presence of, uh, you can call it the industrial, you know, the military industrial uh, complex, but it's more than that. It's the intelligence organizations, the federal law enforcement, which have become almost uh, more powerful than the state itself. Um, and uh, and then on top of that, yeah, you're right, the uh, Silicon Valley bucks, the uh, all the money, the fortunes that are there, which are greater than any fortunes known in the history of mankind, the, the wealth that those people have and the way they throw it around. Um, and and uh, exactly what Zuckerberg did in the last election, dropped $400 million. Four hundred million dollars uh, okay. to switch votes, you know, because money is the fuel of politics, and okay. he's going to do it again, and they're all going to do it again. And how they control the message, and a good example, a very vivid example, is the Hunter S. Uh, the the Hunter uh, Biden laptop. Okay. I nearly said Hunter S. Thompson. The Hunter Biden laptop. Um, that story came out. That would depth charge any candidate in any normal times, the information that came out about the corruption, the, you know, the outright corruption of the Biden family and, you know, to include the big guy, Mr. 10 percent. And the media sat on it. They colluded and they sat on it. And that information was kept from the voters. Uh, we're not living in normal times. We're living in extraordinary times. And um, it's it's quite scary what's going on. Um, and in any case, though, uh, I'll let you, uh, Pamela, I'll let you, you know, get back to what we wanted to talk about. Yeah, right. OK, so um, so a couple what a couple months ago, you put out that you'd written some books. Yes. And one of them was about survival and which I think that we're all very interested in at this day and time. There you go. Survival mm -hmm. mindset. So why don't you is that a prepper book? I mean, because we hear a lot about prepping, you know, you get online, you can hardly even turn on the television without hearing you need to store up food, you need to prep food, you know. So why don't you tell us about wh what that is and what you suggest um, that we do? And I know that you've said 45 days. That's pretty interesting because I know some people who can't go 45 minutes without, <laughs> without being tracked. So um, tell us about your survival mindset book and then your other book, which I've read, which is very interesting. I, I loved it. Well, uh, survival mindset, a guide on what to do when things go wrong um, is a guide. It includes uh, bushcraft and survival uh, themes and, and uh, information, emergency planning and uh, situational awareness. Um, I'm not a prepper per se, because I see a flaw, a primary flaw in trying to prepare to survive for six months or longer, hunkered down within your uh, residence. Um, survival, th there would be a limited time to that. It has to be a team sport. Um, but it's a good idea to have uh, survival items on hand and uh, bug out items. And a, a good, great example of that is what happened in Florida. If you've got to grab it and go, they had very short notice to uh, to evacuate, and very few of them did evacuate. Uh, if you got to grab it and go, are you ready right now to walk out the door, jump in the, into your car or your truck, go and be confident you've got what you need to be comfortable 
uh, you know, for an initial period of time, then an extended period of time. And um, so I cover things like that. Now, in my house, I keep 15 gallons of water. I buy the uh, those large five gallon water uh, uh, bottles at uh, at Lowe's, you know, the kind that are for a water cooler. That's for if the power goes out, then I can't get water out of my well. I need to have a I need to develop a uh, a, a hand pump or, of course, I can hook it up to my generator. But just for power outages during winter storms that we've got water um, prior to a winter storm. I put five gallons of water in uh, coolers next to every toilet. That's so you can flush the toilet. You take a little bucket, pour it into the toilet. It works. I learned that trick in Thailand, right? Okay. Um, it's a good idea to have at least a month's worth of food. And uh, I, I'm a big proponent of spam. Okay. It's a perfect survival food. A family of four could live off one can of spam for a week if they were really hungry and really rationing it out. So it's a it's it's high uh, protein, it's uh, high fat content, high salt, all the things that you need in a survival situation. The trouble is once you start stacking up cans of beans, cans of Spam, cans of chili, everything, you have to rotate your stock eventually. And who wants to be eating all that canned food, you know, to go through to keep your stock rotating? So I donate it to the food bank. Um, because I'm just not going to eat that much spam. <laughs> in any case, um, yeah, it's a good idea. Have a first aid kit, have a first aid kit, and know what kind of uh, injuries you're likely to experience, what kind of maladies uh, you're likely to experience, and how can you treat them. I cover that in my book. Um, and then I, I start, let me back up a bit. I do something that I've never seen in a survival book. And I base this on my experience as a survival instructor in the military. I cover priorities and principles. And your priorities are shelter, water, food, fire, signaling, primitive medicine, weapons and tools, and then miscellaneous. Um, shelter first, because you can live three weeks without food. You can live three days without water but the environment can take you down in three hours. So of course, in the winter time around here, I've got a sleeping bag in the car. I've got a heavy coat in the car and everybody gets in the car. I tell them, get a coat. Well, we're only going here. Yeah. You don't know when you have to get out and walk. Um, and then that's I've got a, we don't think about often is, is, you know, little things like that, getting yeah. out and walking. Well, that's true. Even in places like Georgia, I mean, we've had a couple times when I was living in North Georgia that they have, you know, the ice storms or the snowstorms yeah. come through, and there have been people that have stuck, been stuck on the interstate with no coat, you know, because it's just not that cold in Georgia. But when it's cold, it's cold. You're right. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Uh, it's still North America, and uh, uh, water water supplies and or the means to acquire water uh how to purify it store it food the means how to acquire it uh preserve it store it uh fire fire is a form of shelter fire is used to uh, uh purify water it's used to uh, preserve food prepare and preserve food how to make fire you can use it for signaling um you can use it for morale in the army we call it ranger tv you sit there and you look at the fire um so how can you make fire? How many means of making fire do you have? Uh, firecraft is a, a discipline in and of itself. And then signaling, electronic and non-electronic. And that's a whole chapter in my book. Um, and then, of course, uh, after that, uh, primitive medicine. I don't cover actual trauma medicine and everything. What I suggest is these are the kind of injuries you'd need to learn how to treat and seek this training from the American Red Cross the American Heart Association. Uh, sometimes fire departments give EMT classes, uh, community colleges, and I send people in that direction for a couple of reasons. For one thing, you can't really learn it from a book. You have to attend a class that includes hands-on. And the other thing is it's a liability thing. Uh, if somebody goes to render assistance to somebody and you know a disaster ensues, well, they're covered by the Good Samaritan law, but then the lawyers come sniffing around. They go, well, where'd you learn this stuff? Oh, I learned it from Pete's book right here. Boom, I'm liable. So I had to avoid 
I can teach that stuff. I've taught that stuff. I've taught trauma medicine. I, I am an EMT, but I had to back off for liability purposes. But I did identify primitive medicine, and this is the kind of medicine people uh, do in prisoner of war camps, places like that, using salt as a medicine, using hot water as a medicine, using chalk as a medicine, using fire and ash as a medicine, um, and, and treatments uh, when you have absolutely nothing. Um, then I go into primitive weapons and tools. I had to actually include a chapter about navigation uh, because it occurred to me I'm writing to a wide audience and most people have no idea of navigation. And so I covered that. And of course, it's hard to replicate the entire US Army uh, map reading and land navigation manual, which takes 40 hours to teach in the classroom and about four days of you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and heartache out there in the woods trying to find snakes in the middle of the night following your compass. Um, I, I couldn't replicate that, but I did the best I could. I, I covered um, not only using compasses, the compass that's in your uh, smartphone, which is a actual magnetic compass, but also I covered using the sun and the stars, um, a few tricks of the trade like that. And if you're in any city, in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in the third world, the developing world, you'll see satellite dishes on the sides of buildings everywhere. Yes. Which way are they pointing? I forget, is it up, right? They all point south. Okay, oh, but okay. The constellation is around the equator. And okay. so if you're in the Northern Hemisphere and you're in a city and you wanna know immediately which ways, north, east, south, west, just look at satellite dishes, they'll tell you. Oh. I did no, not that's think great information. Yeah, yeah that's wow. good. The one thing I wanted to include about bug out bag, um, an, an item uh, that is not in my book, that I have to include in a, in a future version, is take pictures of all your documents, uh, your important documents, passports, driver's licenses, uh, uh, birth certificates, deeds, everything you've got. Take pictures of them and save it to a thumb drive mm. because you might have to like scoot real fast. Um, particularly if, what if there's a fire, you know, in your residence and have that thumb drive like next to your car key, uh, or, uh, in your bug out bag. Pete, can um, I add one thing? To, can I add one thing to that is uh, one, one thing that I would also recommend. And this is, that's great advice and have a duplicate one that you actually mail to someone else because Many in many cases in yeah. catastrophe, they're they're expecting you not to have your documents. And our documents, our live signature documents are the only things that hold up in the court of law yeah. today. So I always advise people to close on their properties in person, even yes. though you can do it digitally. It, it it is to your benefit, everybody. I promise you that. And, and Pete, if they back them up on a USB drive, the reason I say that is because my mom and I have had USB drives go corrupt yeah. and have to replace a lot. And during like a Thanksgiving weekend on a POS system, right, where we thought we had like duplicate backups and we didn't. And we even had like a real, like at that point, listen, we had a few minutes to, with technical glitches getting on here, we had a technology expert helping us then that that's when I actually started, you know, doing social medias because, because of situations like that. It's well, you can wild. save them, you can save them in the cloud, email something to yourself and it's automatically saved in the cloud. But of course, then you're uh, subject to is, is the internet up. Right. Um, yep. But yeah, duplicate thumb drives. Absolutely. Um, one more thing I'd like to say about survival mindset is the introduction and the opening chapter I talk about man in the primitive state okay. and think of the hunter gatherer type uh, societies, the Australian Aborigines, uh, these tribes that they continually find in uh, the Amazon, uh, etc. cetera. Um, what was life like then? And my point is what can we learn from that? What can we gain from that? What do we still have inside us that we can use in our daily lives in situational awareness and in survival? Um, you know, the, the survival attitude and consider the, um, your average hunter gatherer type person, they live in groups of about 30 to 40, roughly the size of an infantry platoon too many. And they, they, they'll denude the uh, environment of stuff 
uh, to live off of. And uh, so it's too big a group, too few, and they can't hunt and gather enough stuff to survive. It's too small a group. So it's somewhere around between 30 and 40, roughly half male, half female, um, half juvenile, half adult. Uh, adult is defined as age 12 and above. Um, you die of old age somewhere between 35 and 45. Um, that was man in the Stone Age. I was in Ethiopia. Uh, I was in the National Museum there in Addis Ababa looking at a, a skeleton, the fossilized remains of a human being 200, 2 million years old, not 200, 2 million wow. years old. Yeah, um, the famous Lucy. Um, she was about four and a half foot tall. They were small back then. Wow. But just to look at that, people have been around that long living in that style, you know, as hunter gatherers. Um, do all right. Remember, do you remember, do you recall what her teeth look like by chance? Oh, I can't remember right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that um, I, I was hearing like a dentist say about teeth, you know, about yes. how we're treating our teeth now, we're actually damaging our own teeth. Supposedly, I, I have to find out a little bit more information, but I was just curious if you remember, because, you know, there was no teeth back then. And he was saying, like, look at all these old skeletons. They all have yeah. teeth. And they had, no, they had no, you know, they had, they didn't have what we have now. But they also didn't have the crappy food that we have now. They had well, to they chew on things. Of, <laughs> yeah, they didn't have a lot of carbohydrates. And so there weren't a lot of sugars. Um, but, yeah, my, my point about the, uh, the hunter-gatherers is... Um, we only got away from that lifestyle about 12,000 years ago, which was the beginning of the agricultural revolution, um, which of course is when villages, towns, and cities uh, developed, uh, civilization being defined as being able to uh, have one more day, you know, have be able to store up enough stuff for the security of one more day. That's the beginning of civilization. That was 12,000 years ago. Okay, the anthropologists and the biologists, they, uh, they say that it takes about 36,000 years for an observable evolutionary trait to manifest itself. But we're not even halfway away from that. So in other words, we're still hardwired for that lifestyle where you're seeing the same 30 or 40 people every day that you've seen all your life. Now, fast forward to where we are now. You walk down any city street anywhere in the world, you're surrounded by strangers. Uh, I can go up to the little shopping area north of where I'm at, about uh, 20 minutes up the road. I can go there every day of the week. I'll never see the same person twice. Uh, it's extraordinary. So we're surrounded by a sea of strangers, and yet we're still hardwired for man in the primitive state. So that goes a long way towards suggesting why people are going so crazy these days more and more often. Um, and and in any case, so that's the whole meaning behind mindset of my book in the title there, Survival Mindset. Do you, which is exactly, and I, and I want to encourage everybody that's listening, um, mm -hmm. we're going to have a, sp a special link for you, um, Pete, on patriotsperspective.com forward slash Pete dash Crendenton. So that's running along the bottom. It'll also be a link that we will have to make sure that people know exactly where to go, make sure that they know where to get your books, um, just in case you get booted off of Amazon or anywhere else. Because listen, they don't like oh, they don't yeah. like they don't like people that that are going to sway them away from like truth and how to survive anything that they might throw at us for sure. Well, I was looking at it on Amazon, and for some reason, the price is almost double of what it is. On Barnes & Noble, it's there at the regular price. Okay. And the, the link from my publisher, Blacksmith Publishing, goes to the Barnes & Noble site. And okay. what I think it is, is people are selling, they're reselling um, the older used copies, yeah. and hey, the price is going up. So I guess that's... Yeah. Uh, the vote of confidence. Eh? Good. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, and the, and the other thing that's happening with some of the authors that we've interviewed, one reason um, I've agreed to make pages for everyone, Pete, is because some of the authors have either sold out and their publishers are saying, oh, we can't reprint anymore. So we're all, also mm -hmm. like helping them find printers. Yeah. Um, and believe it or not, I'm not going to say where we're having them printed, but you know, because we don't want them to know that either. So that's another way I believe they're trying to censor it because they don't they don't want us to have the printed version of your book. 
because what are we going to need to go to? If, That's exactly right. The printed yeah, version. Yeah, the printed there version. is an electronic version, but right. yeah, absolutely. You're going to need the, uh, it's a field guide. Yeah. It fits, it fits into uh, a Ziploc bag and then it fits right into your cargo pocket. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that's awesome. So in terms of in terms of the survival mindset, can you tell us about um, I know mom probably has her mic muted um, because I think she wanted to ask you. I do. I do. Well, I mean, you know, we were supposed to interview Pete a couple of weeks ago um, before. And I um, well, we were having something go on and I, I text him and I said, we're going to have to delay. And he goes, well, I'm going to have to delay because I'm headed to Florida. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking, you know, survival mindset and the people that had to um, uh, had to evacuate like Sanibel Island and all that. And I know I've talked to you a little bit about it, but could you share a little bit of your experience down there? And then I want you to share some about your other book as well. The one that I really, really enjoyed reading is and I, I still like a paper book as much as as much as technology seems to have taken over. I still like a paper book. I like to take it down to the pool and read it and relax. And I loved it. So um, so that was a, that was a really fun book. And I want you to talk about that. But before you do that, while we're on the mindset issue, you know, maybe give us a little perspective since you're back from Florida. What you got back not quite a week ago, right? I got back uh, Friday night. Why don't you tell us about a little bit about your experience down there and what you saw? Because, I mean, I've got friends down there, but, um, you know, they're in the midst of cleaning up and everything. Yeah. So I, I'd, I'd really like you to share what you saw down there. Well, I've been through uh, probably 10 or more uh, typhoons, hurricanes, cyclones. Uh, a typhoon is a hurricane when it's in the Western Pacific. Uh, typhoon just means big wind in Chinese. Uh, it's a cyclone when it's in the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean, um, and uh, of course hurricanes in the Carolinas. Uh, I've seen some pretty widespread flooding and devastation, uh, but nothing like what I saw down there. Uh, it looked like the atom bomb had gone off uh, out there on the island. The first place uh, we went to was uh, North Naples, and that's a uh, very exclusive neighborhood. Uh, a lot of money there. Uh, we were guarding a building which was uh, little little condominiums, uh, beach condominiums, about uh, 1,100 square feet that sell for about one and a half million dollars, which I can't imagine. These things were like bed sitting rooms that go for a million dollars, uh, one and a half million dollars. And um, in North Naples, the ground floor of every beachfront building looked like somebody had driven car bombs into it and just blown it all out. And I've seen what car bombs do to the insides of buildings. It was just, it was that, um, it was unbelievable. And wherever there had been, uh, patios paving, uh, towards on the beach side, that was all disrupted, all washed up. Now there were craters and you could look down there and see foundation pilings, which were 12, 12 inch by 12 inch steel reinforced concrete snapped in half. Uh, what the water did was unbelievable. And they're just going to have to destroy that building. Um, we were in that part of town. We had just driven down. Uh, we drove down because we had to bring our firearms with us and it's easier than dealing with the, uh, the airlines. So we drove 20 hours to get there. Then we pulled duty right away because the guy we were leaving had been on duty for more than 24 hours. And um, we were exhausted and we're sitting in the front of the vehicle and we became aware at night, there was no light, none. We became aware that there were people moving through the ruins, uh, looters. And that was so dystopian. It was like Night of the Living Dead. And, uh, you know, it was like that film uh, Legend or the Omega Man. And, uh, you know, we, we said to each other, well, what are we going to do? You know, what are these firearms for that we're, we're carrying? You know, if somebody's going off with a wide screen TV or something, what are we going to do? You know, I'm, I'm not willing to launch a bullet over over that. Right. So we decided, OK, the firearms are to protect our lives and to protect other people's lives. And that's the start and stop of it. We had to do an assessment because it was just so weird and otherworldly. Um, then for about the next week, I was guarding a Costco gas station 
in Fort Myers uh, near Cape Coral. Um, and basically, uh, because they'd had some anxiety at first, they were rationing fuel at first, but then um, it was obvious that things had uh, achieved a, a tempo of normalcy. Uh, during that time, I uh, observed uh, wind damage on every single building in Cape Coral and in Fort Myers. Every business sign, big plastic business signs, like out in front of McDonald's, et cetera, all blown out. Um, but they didn't have widespread flooding. But they had enough flooding where you couldn't use the water. So water couldn't go into the ice machine. So there was no ice. And that was a problem. And restaurants couldn't open. Um, they couldn't open because uh, they couldn't get water, but also they wanted to cut their people loose to go home to you know, attend to their recovery. Uh, so getting a proper meal was very challenging. Uh, I lived off of uh, basically bread, cheese, crackers, cheese, pepperoni, cheese, apple, uh, trail mix uh, for more than 10 days. And the power finally came on after about 10 days. But, you know, there's no restaurants and I'm moving real fast. So I don't have time to prep a proper meal. Ate a few cans of chili. Finally had a meal uh, at a Waffle House. One sit down meal the whole time I was down there. I was down there for two weeks. Uh, the last couple days I was there, I went out to the island and um, that was mind boggling. Like I said, it looked like it got hit by the atom bomb. Um, you go to the causeway and the first thing you see is a ship on the side of the road. I'm not talking about a yacht or a large boat. I mean, a ship. This, these were fishing trawlers, which are small ships, but they're still huge, you know, uh, and it, it's, it's so out of perspective. And then you go up over the causeway and you see more of those fishing ships up where they'd floated up and gone to the land, about half of them. And then, of course, boats all over the place, cars all over the place. Um, and then you start seeing the destruction. Wide swaths of neighborhoods just look like Hiroshima. Um, other places looked like I described in North Naples. The flooding had just come through and destroyed houses. Um, and, and I mean, it was terrible. Um, the place smelled pretty ripe. And every now and then you could smell a body. Uh, we were trying to find out how, how many people died. And... The press is reporting about 100, and uh, that was backed up by the law enforcement people that I spoke to, um, although they were still finding bodies. Uh, FEMA had ordered 1,000 body bags, but they're sticking with the uh, around 100. Uh, it might be double that, but that's just speculation. And um, I, I heard some pretty horrific stories. Uh, one guy, he, he weathered the storm out. Uh, a homeless couple that I met at Costco, they talked about weathering the storm out in a tent. Um, and they why eventually would they, had... Why would, they go, why would they weather the storm in a tent? I've never understood why that... Well, they had no place to go. They're homeless. Oh, okay, okay, okay. They couldn't even okay. evacuate. I, oh, okay. They're homeless. Okay, okay. Yeah. I thought that maybe somebody had moved out of there. Because I have heard of people like going out of their house like into an rv or yeah I never understood why they why they change you know yes oh poor people with the homeless people that's awful yeah. so they're yeah, going to be homeless so floor is a good place to be opportunity because it, you know this is the other misnomer I, I actually believe it or not i'm the girl who stops and talks to the homeless people yeah. um, when i see them out and um what i'm finding with the homeless encampment here at least here in miami are yes. they bring them in they get their social security numbers and they begin to collect um this is what i've been told by the homeless i actually have a video from a homeless guy that actually he's very smart and he told me that they they go into each of the shelters they get their social security numbers and evidently that shelter gets money whether they come or not they're only supposed to get money like every day right. and what's happening is they get their social security numbers and they continue to say that they're, those people are coming there and they're not. So he says if they're in another part of town, they'll say, oh, no, you can't come in here because you're already checked in the other place. And he's like, but we're not. And That and he, doesn't surprise me because a system like that with no oversight is going to get abused. Yeah, 
exactly. So that's that's what I want you know people to know too, because you know when we're all looking at these homeless people on the side of the street, number one, stop and ask them why they're homeless. You know, ask them. You know, I, and I'm not a fan of giving the money. Listen, guys, I'm not a fan of giving the money unless you want it to go to drugs or alcohol. Right. And, um, but because in many cases it does. This guy was actually really funny with my neighbor and and she wanted to give him money and he's he's she's like go buy some beer and he's like okay thank you and i'm going to get him some something to eat over here before he goes nuts on me you know so and and he was i won't say he was honest because i don't know what he did with the money but the point is just ask them what the problem is in your own neighborhood or your own county because i'm going to start a little investigation to find out what's really going on with them and why these organizations are claiming that they're there. You know, basically it's like we get on, we can do an audit if we're, if we're, you know, if we just stop by, find out how many people are going in, how many people they're actually feeding or a volunteer in the organization to find out really how it's going down. So the homeless, the homeless people on Sanibel, they made it through the hurricane. Oh, they weren't on Sanibel. They were in Cape Coral. The other side, okay. but there was flooding there, of course. Um, yeah, well, the whole homeless uh, uh, dilemma, you know, uh, it, it kind of haunts me. I met people who are multi-billionaires, and I met and I had conversations with, you know, the homeless and everybody in between. So, you know, that in itself was uh, interesting. And, you know, if if I had, uh, you know, Bill Gates's money, mm -hmm. you know, if, if, if I'd consider building a bunch of housing, building apartments, you can do it out of shipping containers, right? Put them all in there, clean them up, give them a chance, give them some sort of uh, make work jobs, what have you, and see how many then rehabilitate and become part of society and how many, you know, are actual no hopers. Uh, because that's what they do in Europe, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, I've said to me, it seems very simple. I mean, I know that, you know, it's a simplistic approach, but yeah. it seems like that they could, um, you know, considering it's the county that's getting the money, why don't the county also su supply them with a job? Because what I'm looking at, like I'm looking at our medians and our islands where they could, these people would probably be happy to come to learn how to garden, right? Like if you had a garden leader, learn, yeah. teach them how to garden. And, you know, take it, like you said, take them to a normal home, even if it's a tent camp, you know, where they're actually getting a meal and they're they're feeling some sense of community in some way, shape or form. I don't think it could be that hard. But I think the problem is us as citizens, we're not really paying attention to it because you know, yeah. we cannot pay attention to it until we're there. Right. Uh, well, there, but for the grace of God, go on. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, uh, so it, it's something that concerns me because it's the, the human side, you know, it, it's heartbreaking. Um, yeah. And uh, thank you for going down, Pete. I mean, because I know I mean, even though I know you probably had a contract or something to go down, but in terms of actually being one to go and um, help these people, I can't thank you enough. Well, um, quite honestly, I was trying to duck out of it. And then the owner of this security company, you know, I told him ages ago, you ever need me, I'll be right there. And I'm, I'm your guy. And then he called me. So I, I couldn't get out of it. <laughs> so did you guys fly back? Did you fly back? Yeah, I flew back. I left my my kit down there. I'm going back. We're just yeah. there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I just had to take care of some things here. Um, some, yeah. Some okay. Personal business here. So what did you see? You told me something when you flew out and looked out the window. Oh, yeah. Well, driving out to the airport, just miles and miles and miles of, uh, you know, very expensive houses on a grid. And uh, these are people from up north, retirees. These houses are uh, anywhere between 500,000 to a million dollar properties, nice houses. Uh, and that's obviously what I was looking at. And there was so much damage to roofs, uh, et cetera. Uh, a lot of damage down there. And um, so just driving past miles and miles for hours you know, uh, of all these, uh, neighborhoods and flying out, I was looking down and you could see they're all laid out like a grid, so much of it. And then, you know, I was interested in the grid and interested in what I'm seeing. And I'm a lot of blue plastic where they, uh, had to put temporary, uh, protection over roofs. Then there was a lot of green, a lot of green and water. I mean, a lot. 
and uh, Florida is a big place and it's got a lot of swamp and forests. Uh, and I know I've been in the swamps and forests um, and it just made me think North America is huge. Yeah. And we are, we are the country, rather we're the continent with the most wilderness out of all the continents, unbelievably. Yeah. And, um, I, I, yeah. I, I saw a pile of uh, telephone poles, power poles, I should say, uh, stacked up uh, where they were going to go in and repair and replace, you know, uh, about a football field full of these enormous wooden power poles. And I told my sidekick, uh, if we were in Europe or Africa or Asia, they would be made out of cement. They make power poles there out of steel reinforced cement. And, um, and he said, why, why? He couldn't understand that they don't have wood like that in those places. They don't have a forestry industry like we've got. They just don't have plentiful wood and all these trees. And he goes, but it's a renewable resource. And yeah, they don't have it. Uh, they might do in Africa, but it's different kinds of trees. They don't have pine trees like that. And anyhow, no matter how hard you treat the wood in Africa, you put it in the ground, the termites will eat it. Mm -hmm. go right. over and it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, just that boggled his mind. The fact that he, he took for granted what he was looking at. And I was looking at it thinking you'd never see that in Europe. That wood is worth gold. They think it's crazy that we make our houses using wooden studs. Yes. Over there, we use steel steel frame and or cinder blocks mm -hmm. or precast cement. Even the furniture makers, um, uh, some of the some of the English furniture makers, we actually have them here in Miami that makes some of our furniture, and he he actually like just he's always in awe at the wood that we have. You know, the natural yeah. wood to the area. And um, even, you know, the, the woods that we have available, you know, from other regions as well, too, you know, that are more exotic. But yet the local wood selection that we have is just amazing and, and abundance and cheap in comparison. Yeah, we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. We yeah. take it for granted. And that was what I was thinking as I looked out the airplane at all that vast wilderness, mm -hmm. you know, as, as much cities and development as they have in Florida, it's... The, the Everglades are enormous. They're gigantic. And that goes for all of North America and the United States. I mean, people just have no idea how big our country is mm -hmm. and how, how uh, wide open it is. And just think, you know, Western Europe could probably fit in the size of Texas, definitely within the size of Alaska. Yeah, um, yeah uh, the, the UK, you could cram the entire UK into the Carolinas. Wow. And, you know, and, and people from the UK, I've heard them say, oh, we're, we're going to come over and you can like just drive over and visit. You don't understand. You know, it would take us a day and a night to get there. Yeah. They have no appreciation for how big America is. No, they don't. They have, they'll say they're, they're going to come over here for a week. And yeah. I'm like, well, which part? Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, I'm going to go to the West. I'm going to go to LA and I'm going to go to New York. And I'm like, you're going to spend your whole time in a plane. You know, yeah. you're coming that long, and we don't really have trains. It takes a really long time to get yeah. anywhere on a train here, so <laughs> you're kind of doomed. Um, in terms of this, what you saw from the plane, um, yeah. you said you it, it looked like a pattern. Did it look like a pattern at, at all? Like a pattern? Are, are you saying or? Oh, you're talking about the layout of uh, of suburbia there. Yes, absolutely. It was a grid. Yes. Okay, because interesting. Yeah. Um, so. Did it look like anything that could be weather warfare at all? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I, I, there was weather. Okay. You know, um, whether or not it was generated uh, uh, by, you know, some kind of means, I would have no idea. Yes. Yeah, so some people don't realize that, you know, our government actually has a patent to control the weather. Um, so that is, you know, here's the application, the, the process. Um, it's completely downloadable here on YouTube, um, and, I, and I'm showing everybody just so you can see exactly where it's at, um, because I know some people, when we say, you know, the, they have the ability to manipulate the weather, it's very difficult for people to believe and understand, um, but here's the patent right here. So it's amazing to me that, um, you know, since 1948, um, there's been this patent and it's you know publicly available um, that we're able to see 
It's actually patent number US2550324A. 2550324A. So if everybody wants to look that up, they can we can see that they've been able to control the weather. So it's amazing to me as to if they can control the weather, why there keeps being these issues in specific places. And, um, you know, people have reported many times, you know, out in California, there are firemen that are reporting, you know, specific neighborhoods that have like a line and it literally like the, the fire stops at the lines of the neighborhoods. And, you know, it's just all very um, interesting to me and suspicious at the same time that they're able to do this. And um, in terms of, and, and, oh, it looks like I was not even sharing the patent, so I need to share the correct page. I just showed the patent number. But uh, it's all just so interesting as to why they would why different things would happen, right? Because we all know that our government makes a ton of money whenever they are, whenever there's any kind of war or warfare going on and the vast amount of money and who actually gets paid um, during the process. Because I'll tell you, I'm going to have um, my neighbor on and he is going to go over the amount of money that was collected for Champlain Towers and um, he is actually the manager of the fund that went directly to um, all of his residents. He was the you might want to remind them what Champlain Towers is, Christy. Oh, okay. so Champlain Towers was uh, the tower that actually fell in Surfside. So many people know it as Surfside. Uh, but the, the, the city of Surfside and the county of Miami-Dade collected a huge fund that none of the residents saw. So I think that's also a misnomer. So every episode and pete and pete does not this is not pete's he doesn't we don't have to agree on this okay so i don't know anything about this stuff i was gonna say but yeah i was gonna say i want to make sure that people know that, that you don't even know this um this is coming from someone else but um you know in terms of them actually controlling the weather having these open patents right in front of our face to be able to do it is all just extremely interesting. I'm just saying we should all be asking questions, looking it up, because, Pete, did you know about that patent before? No, I didn't. But the only thing I know in this, uh, in, in related any way to this, would be they've been seeding clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they use? It's like mm -hmm. silver iodide uh, crystals to create rain. And I was reading a, a, a book about the Sante Raid, which was the uh, the the rescue mission they flew the free prisoners of war out of north vietnam in a town called sante near hanoi um and the prisoners had been moved and they'd been moved because there was flooding in the river and it was ironic because uh the united states had been seeding clouds up in that region in order to make the ground soggy uh to make it difficult to move uh, supplies mm -hmm. to the south by the ho chi minh trail and uh, as a result they had this uh this flooding um, and then the prisoners were moved. And so when the rescuers arrived, uh, there was nobody there. Um, th that's all I know about the weather and anything to do with the US government and or the military. Um, speaking of rain, <laughs> speaking of rain, uh, Pete has another book, which I read. <laughs> so, I we can get off on a more familiar one. subject. <laughs> If you I want to tell about your a thousand drops of rain. <laughs> yeah, a thousand drops of rain is a novel, and it was I just tell us about that because I found that to be a very entertaining book. It was. It was. Thank you. It was just published uh, by my publisher, Blacksmith Publishing, mm -hmm. and um, it originated when I was pulling a security uh, contract on an oil rig off the coast of Africa, and I had a little workstation up there on the bridge. And I, uh, I had time on my hands, 12 hour shift. And all I had to do was just walk around the oil rig every now and then and make sure the pirates weren't there. If the pirates came is another story. <laughs> and um, so I had time on my hands and I had six months of it I was looking at. So I thought, well, this is a really good time for me to write a book. I've always wanted to be a writer. And um, so this is great. I'm all set up, ready to go. And I didn't know what to write about. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> You know, uh, when I was younger, I wanted to be a writer, but I thought, well, I need adventures. 
so I know what to write about. So I had this, you know, uh, life full of adventure over the past 30 years and, uh, you know, went everywhere and did everything twice. And uh, now I didn't know what to write about. So I wrote about a professional adventurer who wants to write his memoirs and he sits down and he doesn't know what to write about. And I put him in a very interesting place. I, I created this hotel in Southern Thailand. It's built on the cliff, on a, a jungle cliff. And it's a it's an unorthodox hotel. It's a bunch of little cabanas and cabins and uh, rooms with little decks and interlocking staircases and ladders all up and down the cliff. And the main edifice is a traditional Thai um, structure. Uh, and there's a large deck above it and embedded within the structure is a, a traditional colonial style pub. And my protagonist, he's in there. Is that the correct word? In any case, he's in there. Uh, and people come to him and visit him, people from his former life. And they're, you know, ex-military types, contractors, mercenaries, ne'er-do-wells, you know, all kinds of people. And um, they tell him their story. And each story is a chapter, and each story is actually starts out based on something that actually happened to myself or to a friend of mine. The giant serpent, mm -hmm. that actually happened to me in Bangkok. Oh, really? Um, yeah, giant serpent came out of a tree. Wow. Uh, yeah, head to side. I think that's what makes the book interesting as I was reading it, because I'm thinking that you said that it was something that happened to you or to happen to somebody else that you knew. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that that's, that, that was more entertaining. You made it more entertaining. Well, then, of course, I always have the, the stories warp off into the fantastic and the amazing and, you know, the, the realm of science fiction and spiritualism and surrealism and weirdness. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, because I thought, hey, let's let's really take the ball and run with it. And and so that's what I did. And uh, and everybody seems to enjoy it. I put pictures in it. I, yeah, I, you did. Right. I took pictures uh, and I, I would use uh uh, this uh, app on my phone where I could make them uh, like sepia style or, or with that, the linotype style of graphic mm -hmm. art, like you see the art on a dollar bill or something. I did that to set the themes. Every uh, The beginning of every chapter has a picture and uh, usually one or two pictures throughout the uh, chapter. And I did that because people like to look at pictures when they read books. And mm -hmm. that way, even if you can't read, you can enjoy the book. <laughs> Okay. So are you going to do an audio book? Yes, absolutely. That one? You should. Yeah. You definitely yeah, I, the I, hardware think you narrate, I think you should narrate your own book, Pete. That'd be amazing. That's that's my intent. I've got the hardware for it right yeah. here. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and I'm I'm learning how I'm I'm trying to figure because I I learned what not to do. Don't record it as a uh, MP3. Um and so I've got to figure out uh, there's another way to record it, too. And I want to learn how to splice in sounds like, you know, seagulls squawking and waves crashing mm -hmm. and stuff. So I can have the beginning and end of a chapter, sort of, you know, trains and planes and that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. I'm going to uh, I'm going to make an audio book because people enjoy that. Yeah. Well, don't come to don't come to us for audio advice. That's all. I, I, got. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to say, we might want to come to you for audio advice after <laughs> Yeah, well, nowadays you don't need a sound engineer. It's all out there on the internet. You can do your own thing. But we actually did have a sound engineer on the other day, uh -huh. and we still like managed to mess it up. <laughs> Poor Dana, yeah. he's going to have to step back in. <laughs> yeah, it's in any case. Yeah, that, that's my plan to go with oh, the that story. That would be great. That was that's going to be a great audio book. I'll tell it you. Will be. It I will love the idea of sound book. effects. That's mm -hmm. that is going to be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it would be interesting if I could get female voices to do the female characters, uh, particularly the Asian, the Southeast Asian wow. girls that in there, because I mean, I can't mimic that the way they speak. <laughs> you should go to Angela, uh, comedian Angela Johnson. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure. She has so many different voices. That's what I mom said. Yeah. She has like the Asian nail salon girl voices and, and everything yeah. that she She's a Hispanic comedian. She's hilarious. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting off track. She does. Oh, that, that's all right. You know, well, there's a lot of Southeast Asian spiritualism and surrealism in my book. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'm concerned that I might uh, upset or offend the Thai people 
um, with my references to Buddhism and Hinduism. So I had it proofread by uh, two different Thai people, friends of mine. I said, did I get this right about Buddhism and the Buddha? Because Thai Buddhism is a little bit different than uh, like, for example, Zen Buddhism. Um, and they said, you got it perfect. You got it spot on. How did you know this? Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, a, just a little experience, yeah. life experience. <laughs> yeah, because, awesome. yeah, one of my stories uh, involves uh, uh, a character who comes into possession of a Buddha image, uh, you know, a, a small Buddha statue. And he has to, he's tasked with, transporting it up uh, from Singapore all the way up to uh, northern Thailand into Laos. And, uh, you know, the Thais are very touchy about moving Buddha statues in and out of the country. You're not allowed to do it. And the Buddha statues themselves are considered, they have a spirit. It's a form of animism, right? And, uh, well, that features in this story. And I was very uh, concerned that I got it right, uh, you know, so that the... Uh, I, I don't want to offend the Thai people or, you know, uh, somehow, you know, uh, get it wrong. And I was told, oh, no, you got that perfectly. How did you know? And I also wrote about um, a form of an exorcism because uh, there's a, the Thai people practice a form of animism, which is spirit worship. Um, and it's not Buddhism. Uh, on the surface, uh, an observer might think, oh, they're doing some Buddhist stuff. No, it's not. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, they have the spirit houses in every property over there mm -hmm. in Thailand. And before you build, you have to put the spirit house there. Then you have to have a ceremony and get the spirits of the land into the spirit house and then keep them happy. Bring them food, bring them drink. Um, if they're not happy, bad things will happen. And uh, yeah. And and so, of course, I, I discussed that concept a few times. Um, and uh then, of course, I had a few crazy stories uh, about uh, other places, uh, adventures down in Africa, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, Central America. Yeah. <laughs> they just um, need to buy the book to read about them, right, Pete? Yeah. Yeah. They need yeah. To write a book. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll give you one more one more hint. Um, okay. I wrote a story about uh, the, the revolution in Central America. I created a fictitious country. And that country was actually El Salvador. I was down there. And I heard it from my hotel this uh, woman's voice on a megaphone every night and a crowd. And I thought, well, they're having some sort of political uh, movement going. And my, ha my, my hotel was on the edge of the Zona Rosa, you know, the uh, mm -hmm. entertainment. Red zone. Pink zone. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the safe part of town, the party part of town. <laughs> and yeah. there, it was on a street with a T intersection leading away from the T intersection every night for three nights. I heard this woman's voice and all this, crowd shouting and so i created the story about how it was a uh, a revolution a street revolution where the uh the the old order was taken over they stormed the uh president's palace and then i my hero became you know they wanted to make him el presidente He's like don't do that and then the story proceeds from there and just gets crazier and crazier and crazier well I found out after, you know, three days of this running through my imagination, I went out there and I, I walked up and I realized I found a place. Uh, it was like a giant cage. It was the size of about a football field with large uh, chain link fence going up about 60 feet. And inside were all these weird apparatuses, giant uh, cushions, all different colors, ladders, ropes. Uh, uh, and what it was, it was a TV game show. Oh, <laughs> but I created that story about a street revolution that was in my imagination because I could hear it, but I couldn't see it. But that's what you were really thinking that it was prior to <laughs> knowing. Yeah. Got to get all the facts. Yeah. That's oh, weird. dear. Well, Pete, thank you so very much for coming on and sharing with our audience, sharing your books and um, all of your knowledge, your survival knowledge. We hope that we can have you back on soon. We hope that um, everything goes well with your next trip back to Florida. Maybe you can come on thank and report you. on that afterwards. And do you have any final closing comments? Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll keep you informed. And uh, yeah, what I'd like to say, my book, Survival Mindset, it's uh, available at Barnes & Noble. 
It's available on Amazon. There's yeah. actually an ebook version of it. My novel, A Thousand Drops of Rain, the same. Um, or you can go to my publisher's uh, website, Blacksmith Publishing, and click through there, and it'll take you to Barnes and Noble. And um, I, thank you very much for having me on your show. And uh, you know, keep the faith. You're very welcome. And, and and everybody, you can also go to PatriotsPerspective.com forward slash Pete dash Crendenton. That way we can update if Pete has any changes or his publisher kicks him out or anything like that. <clears throat> we can make sure that you always have a way, a path to your books. Pete. <laughs> I'm all about backup plans these days <laughs> as we survive the digital, the digital war and the digital minds that yeah. tend to be going off all around us. Um, Mom, any closing comments? I just want to say thanks for thanks to Pete for being on and and keeping us up to date and and for the books and uh, can't wait to write the Amazon review <laughs> now that we've got a, a pathway. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, and we'll, and I'll be doing that. I very much appreciate your books and can't wait to read the survival mindset. Pete, does Am do Amazon reviews help your books? Does it help it go to the top? Absolutely. Absolutely they do. Okay, yeah. so everybody, if you go on Amazon, please try to purchase the books on Amazon. We'll make sure that we have the link that we post in the video description below. And mm -hmm. if you will make sure that you write a review after you get the books, that would be super, mm -hmm. super helpful. That's even if they get digital or print, right? Well, that's quite right. Okay, perfect. So please make sure you guys help Pete out, write his review. Um, and if you have any other questions, make sure that you comment them below. We'll be sure to ask Pete on the next, maybe we'll have a segment called Ask Pete. <laughs> ask Green Beret Pete. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pete, for being on. And everybody, just remember to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And we are out. <laughs>